Welcome everybody to Arrange Wild. My name is Kristen Barker. I'm the Community Education Coordinator here at Cal BG. And I'm very happy to be joined by Linda Prendergast, who is <laughs> the head of our Native Designs team here at the Garden. And she will be in just a minute walking us through uh, a demonstration to make a beautiful arrangement using California native flowers. So looking forward to handing you over to her. And a little bit later on, I'm, I'm happy to be joined by Lucinda McDade as well, who is our, our executive director here at the Garden. And she's gonna touch on a little bit more about the plants that we're using today. So you might feel uh, poised to plant them in your own garden and have uh, plants to harvest from and arrange with at your own house. So looking forward to that as well. Um, so I'm just gonna go over the format of the class a little bit and then hand you over to Linda. You know, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with Zoom at this point, but just in case, I encourage you all to use the Q&A if you have any questions. Um, we'll have time to kind of periodically address those throughout the demonstration and through the talk, um, but we'll definitely have time at the end if you have any lingering questions that are unanswered. So we'll do that there. I also encourage you all to use the chat, which we kind of got started as we were, as everyone was logging in. Um, it's a great way to let us know if you need a little bit more time or you want to see a technique once again, um, just go ahead and put that in the chat. And it's also a great way to connect with each other. Um, so, you know, as the default, when you sign in, the chat is set to all panelists. If you click that blue bar and drop it down, it'll say panelists and attendees. And that way you can kind of connect with each other throughout the class. So I suggest you do that as well. Um, we are recording this, so if you do, you know, later on want to come back and make another arrangement, you'll be able to rewatch this and see the techniques once again. Um, and I typically am able to have that up usually by the end of the day. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but I'll try to have it on the digital content page of our website, which uh, calbg.org, as soon as possible. Um, you'll be able to find that there and on our YouTube channel. And so a little bit about the format of the class, you know, we suggested that everybody kind of lay out some butcher paper or newspaper or, you know, some, uh, some sort of tablecloth that will help you with cleanup. Um, and then also to have a wastebasket and towel on hand should be uh, pretty helpful during this class. And then also we ask you to have a, um, a pair of snips or pruner, pruning shears or some really good kitchen scissors because you'll be using those throughout to kind of trim your plant material. And then as well, a kitchen knife of some sort, a butcher knife like Linda has here, um, that will help, you'll be using that to shape your um, floral foam. So that's what you'll need there. And everybody should have picked up your kits at this point, um, which you know has the decorative items, the basket with the uh, liner, your floral foam and floral tape and also, of course, your beautiful California native flowers. So um, you should all have that. If you don't, I suggest going ahead and grabbing those last remaining items and get set up. And with that, I would like to introduce Linda. Linda, uh, as I mentioned, is the head of the Native Designs team here, which is a wonderful group of volunteers that maintain a area of our garden um, called the uh, Native Designs Flower Garden. Or, or cutting garden. And so they maintain that area and then harvest from there annually to create beautiful uh, arrangements, highlighting you know, the wonderful aesthetic qualities of the many California native plants that we have here at the garden. And so they're a, a wonderful group of very hardworking, talented people with Linda at the helm. And so we're very lucky to have her here with us today. And with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Linda. If, Linda, if you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and Native Designs, and then we can get our demonstration started. Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Arrange Wild class. This is casual, and it's easy, and don't be intimidated by it, and just try to follow along, and we'll make it fun. you got a basket, and the basket has a cellophane bag in it. Set that aside. It has Oasis in it taped to the oasis is a little bit of wire, half a wire. This is your oasis block. And hopefully you have soaked that so that it is saturated with water. 
and in the basket on the inside is a liner, transparent liner. So set your basket aside, set your liner where you can get to it. And here is my pre-soaked oasis. Now, obviously it's too big to fit into the um, liner and it's a square peg going into a round hole. So we need to do some trimming on it. Um, have the, word, the words oasis facing you. There's three sections in the block and go about two thirds, maybe a little shorter than two thirds and slice that right down. Set the big block aside. And then the, the leftover block, cut about an inch and a half. That inch and a half piece goes right in the bottom of the container. You'll note that the oasis itself is not as tall as the container is. Is that, can you see that yet? The container is deeper than the oasis is tall. So we're putting the block at the bottom and then placing the large block of a oasis on top of it, but you need to trim it and taper it first. So you're gonna just kind of shave it a little bit a curvy piece off each corner. So, so wait a minute, Linda, you cut a, a piece and you put it in the bottom. Right. And, and that was a piece that was about what? An inch and- About an inch and a half. Yeah, and then yeah. you put that in the bottom and now you're making another cut of the Oasis to put on top of that first cut, is that right? Right on top of there. Okay, but you've got to trim it because it's too big. It's too big, yes. Yeah. The, the, the um, liner itself is tapered. Now we're going to bevel the edges so that there's more design space in the foam. We're going to slice off on all four sides. So this is one of the things that Linda makes look very easy, but to my mind is a little hard. So you're just angling just You're just making a, a, bev a beveled edge on it, right? Right. Now, while you're doing that, got to get out your cellophane tape, which is packaged like this. This will be the hardest thing you do all day is getting the tape started. But Linda, your oasis is sticking up out of the, it's yeah. higher than the, yeah, okay. And, and about three quarters of an inch. Um, you don't want to go much higher than that. Gravity is at play here because the water, of course, goes through the oasis and down into the bottom of the container. So you want to, we're going to be putting our stems in as deep as we can, because that's where the water is, down at the bottom of the, uh, of the bowl. Can't get away from gravity. Yeah. So you said that the tape thing is the hardest thing we're going to going to do. What's so hard about it? It's getting the doggone stuff started. Oh There's yeah. The blue tab. It's like all scotch tape. You or know, you saran wrap. Of it, like saran wrap. <laughs> yeah. The, so you've got a piece of blue comes off of there, and then there's another smaller piece of blue. You're going to start with the long side of the oasis and you're going to just make a loose cross on it. It doesn't, don't put it right in the middle. Attach it to your flimsy little liner first and go right across. So I have a piece going across here and I'm doing another piece off centered. Wow, so not 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 ninety degrees. Nope, not and not okay. in the middle. Mm -hmm. It sticks nicely to this plastic liner, plastic container, and then you're going to go around the outside, underneath the edge, and catch all four tabs. Oh yeah.
And then do yourself a favor when you cut this and turn your tape under so that the next time you use this roll of tape, you'll have a tab to grab. So, so, so participants, is everybody with us? Everybody is good in terms of what Linda just guided us through? Two layers of oasis. I love the concept of an oasis in a flower arrangement and then kind of securing it so that it doesn't come out when you move it or whatever. Everybody good? That's good. I saw one question about what the second cut was, but I think we managed that. Feel free to drop questions into the into the chat and we can, this is second nature to Linda. And so, you know, she just kind of does it like she gets up in the morning. Oh, um, and I so we have a fast. <laughs> yeah, so it Lynn. goes very fast. So we have a please wait question. I can picture somebody is trying to do the beveling, which to me would be a it's little just, frightening. It's just about, about an inch in, into the block of Oasis and just slice it down direct to the container. Try, hold, try holding that up to show people the angle of the bevel. No, yeah. Can everybody see it? It's kind of like a little pyramid thing almost like. Flat top pyramid. Yeah, and, the, and the, the reason that she does this is that it creates more surface area to put the, the floral materials into, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So the person who said, please wait, are you okay now? Have, are you, you've got the taping part done? Even though she says that's the hardest part, she still does it faster than anybody else because she's used to handling that, that material. Okay, we're ready. I think we're ready to go ahead. You're looking down on your oasis and the word oasis is facing you. So you, you're, you're squared off rectangular, not square, but rectangular. And that rectangle goes right into the basket so that the widest edge of the um, oasis is between the two handles. Got it. At this point, you should- But Linda, but Linda flowers can't read. They don't care which way oasis goes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 um, I do. So now your race is a, is a little bit deeper into the basket. You can see there's not nearly the height that you had coming out of the liner. Okay, we're gonna start greening. And in your bucket, you have two types of greens. So we're gonna start with the lemon leaf, which is this plant right here. This is salal or lemon leaf. It grows in Northern California uh, and a lot in Oregon um, along the forest floor under the redwoods. And you're gonna use every bit of this. <clears throat> so you're gonna cut the tips, just put a jam, jam it into the um, oasis. We're just gonna loosely cover this. and you can twist it, you can put them in at different angles. You're not doing a collar, a flat collar around the outside because that would put things a little bit on a wacky scale. So this is kind of going in the center and push it down in as far as you can. Linda, move the, um, move your, your, um little uh, rotating table a little bit toward the, uh, toward your knife. Yeah, that's good, yeah, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All this technical stuff. So Linda, how, how long are the ends of the stems of that that you're, you're cutting about? Um, probably about three inches, Kristen. Great. The stem is there, and I'm just putting it in at, at different angles. And it's really important to make a fresh cut 
yeah. what that does is that makes a fresh opening into the vascular system, the system of the plant that will let it take water from your oasis and stay fresh longer. If you don't make a fresh cut, then basically the plant will have already started healing over the cut that was made previously. So making a fresh cut really makes a big difference. And I'm using clear down, there's a, there's a cut edge here, but we're using that because we're gonna put it nice and deep and it's not gonna show. So you're just loosely covering the oasis. You just wanna camouflage the oasis and the tape. So I've How, used how's um, everyone doing? Pardon? I was just checking in with the everyone at home. How's everyone doing? Are are you at this stage, the same stage as Linda? You can give us a thumbs up in the chat. Or okay, it looks like we're good. Everyone's at the same stage as you. So we're looking to do a finished arrangement that looks like this. So you can see that it's springy and it's loose and it's meadow-like, and that's your intention. You don't want the flowers to be compacted uh, or French bouquet type. You want it loose so the greens are showing and the personality of all the little blossoms are gonna show on their own. So I'm gonna wait on my ribes. I'm gonna use that toward the end. Let's start with our Matillaha poppy. And you should have one stem that's kind of candelabra shaped. Now the Matilha, this one obviously has bloomed out, but you can take the petals off of it. And it makes a pretty bright yellow flower right in the middle of your arrangement. We're gonna snip this about like yay. So then this part's gonna go clear down into the oasis and I'm putting it on the other side of the handle from me. Wow, Linda, so you just yanked the petals off of it. Yes, I did. And wow. I know that will break some people's heart. But if, if, the, if your um, Matilaha is just cracking white, don't take the petals off. The, they will open. Um, this one has just a little bit of the white petals showing through, but as the days go by and as it absorbs water, it will open action in your arrangement once again. Again, yeah. So the reason you pulled those petals off is because that flower was already open, it which means fair. that it's, it's not going to hold them for very long. No, it's not going to. But hold if them. you had a bud that had the white petals, then you would um, you would leave them on. Right. Okay. Right. Most of the of the flowers in the garden. Uh, and most of the natives are spire shaped. Um, we don't have a lot of big round flowers, but the Matilla is probably the largest flower all year long that we can use. Um, the other rounded flower that we have is the little desert marigold. But most, most flowers, as you can see, the, the penstemon and the salvia blossom, the woolly blue curls is a spire type flower. So to get impact from them, you need to use several at a time or several in a in a grouping so that people will realize that there are, there are multiple flowers in there and not if this was spread out it's just not going to have the impact so you, you see that they all have a little bend in the top almost all of the see they're kind of crooked Linda, people are asking, they got a second poppy. Do they put that in also, or is that for later? Or do they not need that if they? Well, no, you hold on to it. And then later, if you have a hole, you can put more Matilaha in the hole. I only have one stem. I think that they might've got lucky and uh, got okay. two. Not everyone got yeah. two. Yeah. I should see with me, huh, Kirsten? <laughs> Okay, so this is the white sage salvia blossom. And I'm putting the curves like a fountain, one toward me, one out this way, and one out this way. And while it's not a showy flower, 
it's an interesting, has an interesting texture. And of course you can tell it has a wonderful fragrance. Very much. So you're taking advantage of the arcs that the the uh, flowering stems grew with to add kind of a width dimension to your arrangement? Yeah, width and a little bit of whimsy to it. Got it. Okay. Are we all caught up? We're doing okay? <laughs> Somebody's really enjoying the whimsy. <laughs> and I agree. <laughs> Linda, do you want to tell us a little bit? I know when we were out harvesting, you you told us to look for the buds of the matilaha that were just cracking white. Do you want to tell us why we chose those ones? Um, I choose them just cracking the white so that they last longer. Uh, but the warm weather that we've had the last few days uh, just wreaks havoc on the flowers. They, it doesn't wreak havoc. It makes them open up far more quickly. They love the heat and they open. But generally, you're you're pruning the matilla up toward up high, up toward the top of the plant, and you cut off a candelabra, which also is giving you the width in the arrangement with the little buds. Great, thanks. When it looks like everyone's caught up. So okay, when you're cutting in your own garden, or heaven forbid, you're cutting anything here, um, you always want to make a cut, plunge it immediately into water. When we harvest, we, uh, we would cut this branch, this is Ryby's, put a fresh cut down here, strip the bottom of the leaves, put it immediately into water. Uh, and now when we're gonna use it again, or when we're gonna use it in the arrangement, we're gonna also cut the bottom again, but we're not ready for that yet. The pinstemon, the showy pinstemon, or pinstemon, depending on where you're from. Linda, can you um, again move your um, your 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 arrangement closer to your knife? No, the other way. No, no, toward your knife. I don't have a mouse. Knife, I, knife, knife. This knife. knife. Chico, knife. Mm -hmm. Move that. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. Yay. Okay. To your right, someone said, accurately. Joey Pinstemon. Oh, these are gorgeous in the garden now. They're, they're the back um, uh, uh, communities. This is the fields are just aghast with Pinstemon, and it's gorgeous. And you're gonna cut it right in half and get it down slightly smaller than the salvia is, and then kind of in between the salvia blossoms, you're gonna put a pinstemon blossom. Such a gorgeous plant. There's a, is that the pink ones that are out there? Is that a sport, Lucinda, or is it, there's a, the pink pinstemons that are just breathtaking. Well, there's color variation and it may well be just natural color variation. This penstemon, the showy penstemon, penstemon spectabilis is the main one that sort of comes up all of its own, probably what we call site native, meaning that it actually has always been here. Gosh, it's gorgeous already. Okay. Linda, another note about when we were harvesting, you had asked us to find um, pin stem and that the flower buds were really close together. Yeah, you, you, you want to use the, um, now that I've cut this all apart, you want to find stems that where the inner nodes are, are not elongated. The pin stem gets like really, really big. But if you had the great big flowers with the long inner nodes, it's going to be out of scale with the arrangement, uh, and it's just not going to 
wouldn't wouldn't be looking right. So you want to look at for side shoots on the um, plant and younger flowers that have a blossom all the way up to the top. Right. Now there's a commercially produced flower in your bucket, but it is a native and it's called Soledago. And we grow this in the cutting garden, um, but since we don't fertilize and we don't use pesticides and such, ours is much wimpier looking than this is. But again, uh, solid aster it's called or solidago. Or goldenrod. Or goldenrod. Or ragweed, isn't it? No, know. not ragweed. Not ragweed. Goldenrod. So it's a good filler. You only have two stems of it. So I'm going to put. How do you decide where to put it? Design talent and instinct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you put it where you think it'll look pretty. You're going to put it down low. And that looks pretty. And then I'm going to do kind of a color balance. By putting a piece on the other side. This, this is actually a one-sided arrangement. Um, and you'll see when we're finished what I mean. Nice. Okay. You have one piece of yellow lupin and this lupin is an annual. And it kind of has a little bit of, a, of an arch to it too, kind of droopy. And that's gonna go down, breaking the edge of the basket. See how it's aiming down there, toward down toward the table. One of my favorite flowers in the garden is woolly blue curls. And that's this flower right here. It's right now, if you came to walk, you would see that mostly in bloom are, are blue and yellow and, and white. So if you like UCLA colors, you're in, you're in good shape. <laughs> Linda, could you review where you put the lupin and how you're using the lupin to- Lupin is, is down down here, you can, and it's just breaking the edge of the basket. It's bringing the arrangement toward you. Let me put it up here, I guess. So you're using that to kind of bring the arrangement down to earth, down to you, to. It's putting it more toward you. It's just, and we don't, since we only have, eight, ideally we'd have two or three, but. Right. And wasn't relinquishing them. It's um, not a great year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And someone is asking about the fact that when they trim the lupin, the stems are very delicate. Do you have, how do you make, how do you get that into the foam if you've cut it and it's a soft stem? Uh, you're, it, it should, if you cut it right here, where it, just above the foliage, this is a good stiff stem. If you've got one with a soft stem, you maybe cut it a little too high. Yeah. Could you poke a hole in the foam as like kind of like a, a guide or? You could poke a hole in the foam, but you need to fill that hole with water before you put mm. the stem in. Otherwise there'll be an air pocket in the foam and it won't, uh, it won't take up water. I see. We have a question that's, which of these flowers smells so wonderful? And I think that's many of them, but the one that Linda's holding right now is the woolly blue curl. 
And that one to me is so beautifully fragrant. But also the surprising one to me is the um, Catalina Current or the Ribes is, has such a beautiful smell. It's almost citrusy. I don't know how to exactly explain it, but I, you think of it as a ground cover, but it's really, really fragrant and beautiful. And in that case, it's not really the flowers of it, but the foliage, right? Foliage, right. And putting in the woolly blue crows, going to put them in a cluster so that they have more impact, so that they're, the flowers show better. Versus spreading them out in the arrangement. Oh, that's gorgeous. So there's three right here. And I think you have five stems. And the nice thing about woolly blue curls is that even if the stem that you are working with is not actually in flower, all the bracts and everything are still gorgeous and very, very colorful. So it's a great color. And then there's always the amazing fragrance. So you can see how it just kind of explodes from the center of the bouquet and that we've left a little vacant spot right in here. That's on purpose, don't worry. More woolly blue curls, can't have too many. Can't have too many. <laughs> Okay, now evaluate your arrangement for where you need something spiky to, to come out. Uh, and you can put it on the left or the right, but your one of your final flowers, you've got two stems of, uh, I think it's called chaparral mallow, Ooh. lavender mallow. And as uh, Kristen mentioned earlier, this, this comes and it's probably a different family, but um, it comes also in an apricot color, which is beautiful. And it comes, we've got one in the cutting garden that's hot pink. Just a different genus in the case of the apricot mallow, but the same plant family. Ah. Same family that cotton is in. Really? True, absolutely true. Okay, so we're pretty much, pretty much filled in. I've got some see in the back here, so I'm gonna use my Ribes by Bernifolium. Again, wonderful fragrance. Catalina Current, is that right, Lucinda? That's right. And yes, the currants that you can buy in the store are in the same um, genus, actually, Ribes. Beautiful green, really good under in shade in your yard if you have such a location. And so Linda, about what was the length that you were cutting those? Um, about like yay. Just to fill in any holes in the back so that the oasis is camouflage. Gotcha. Okay, don't, now the final don't show your oasis. <laughs> you got, we call that covering your underwear. You don't want your oasis to show and you don't want tape to show. Or your underwear for that matter. Or your underwear to show. Okay. <laughs> no bra straps. So here's the front of my arrangement. And now we're going to do our cluster of um, desert marigolds, Balia. And these flowers are little, they're tiny. So we're going to use them close together so that they have some impact also. Well, they're not really tiny. I mean, I'm just going to have to beg to differ there. Uh, tiny are oak flowers, which are as big as the freckle on your nose. OK. Not that you have freckles, Linda, but. So you're going to take 
your smallest desert marigold, your smallest blossom, and put it up highest, kind of close to the handle on the basket. And then the biggest one you have, you would put down a little bit lower. And this is just to keep the, the scale and the balance of the arrangement bigger toward the bottom. And don't forget to make fresh cuts on everything. It may be tempting to pull one out of your, of your, of your pail there and stick it right in, but that will really reduce its lifespan in your arrangement. You want to make a fresh cut every time. Yeah, and you don't with Oasis, um, you don't want to pull a stem in and out and in and out. Every time you pull it out, when you reinsert it, you have to give it a fresh cut but you don't want to poke a lot of holes in your oasis and get air pockets in there either. Terrible to have air pockets in your oasis. <laughs> but yeah, every time you put it in and pull it out, you're again, you're, you're cramming junk from the oasis into those cells that need to stay open in order to let the plant pull water out of the oasis and into itself to keep it fresh. Abelia has a little bit of a, of a tender stem, so hold it down at the base of the flower and push it down in until your fingers touch the oasis. Don't try to hold it up high and stick it in. You'll break the stem. Ooh, nice. Okay, you have a little cellophane packet that has a bird and a bird nest and some eggs and some moss and some glue. And we're gonna start with the bird nest. And because it's been in a cellophane package and squashed in, in shipping, it's kind of flat. Just kind of loosen it up a little bit, get it a little more rounded. And it's got that dyed sphagnum moss in it, which I think is hideous. <laughs> so pull a little bit of that out. Why do they dye it? I think they just dunk the big bales of sphagnum into probably looks like food coloring. I don't know, ugly. Sphagnum is a lovely color itself. Yeah. And you have a piece of wire. And this is half of, a, of an 18 inch piece. So you've got a nine inch wire. It's 18 gauge, which is the thickest wire a florist would ever use. Um, and it, it graduates up to number 26, which is a very narrow, flimsy hair type wire. You're gonna fold it about two thirds, one third into a horseshoe. You see that? And then you're going to impale that right through the bird nest. So it's at the bottom. It doesn't need to be in the middle. It can be off to the side. Is that wire green? The wire is green. And it was taped to the floral foam. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, yes. Also is a, um, there's a little tube of Gorilla Glue. Open your Gorilla Glue. You can pierce the, pierce the uh, seal with the other side of the cap or with your 18 gauge wire. We're gonna squirt a little bit of Gorilla Glue in the nest. And then take your pretty sphagnum moss, fluff <laughs> it up a little bit. That's great, you thought of everything. Pretty sphagnum to replace the dyed sphagnum, I like it. You know, that florist work is really a lot about detail. Um, and making things look as natural as you can. And the sphagnum moss that comes 
dyed and looks so commercial um, and so phony, you don't want to use it. Okay, so now I'm putting glue on my egg. You have two eggs, not enough for an omelet. <laughs> One off to the side. And you're gluing the eggs into the basket or into the sphagnum moss into the nest. Looks like we've got different species of birds laying eggs in the same nest. Yes. And you've got <laughs> this poor bird. Can you imagine this poor little bird delivering that egg? <laughs> <laughs> they're a little out of kilter here. Okay. So you see my kind of blank spot down here and here in the arrangement where there's only greenery. I'm going to handle this by the wire and impale the wire down into the oasis so that the nest is breaking the edge of the basket. So it's toward you. Bring it out this way. Rotate the, rotate it uh, another 180 degrees. There you go. Yeah, good. Oop, oop, right there. More um, ribes by burnifolium. You want to um, turn your arrangement by the basket. Don't use the handle. Um, and check for holes. And then whatever flowers or stems or greens you have left, make sure all your holes are covered. Don't want to see the oasis. And make sure you put the lid back on your glue. Oh, wait a minute. Don't do that. Let's glue the bird on. The little bird has no legs, as you will see. That's because it's sitting on the nest. So with your nest facing you, put a little bit of glue on the handle. Put a little bit of glue on the bottom of the bird. I'm gonna let it get to slightly tacky. And I'm taking a little bit of the pretty sphagnum. And putting it on the dot of glue that's on the handle and then putting more glue on top of it. And putting the bird on top of the glue, and you want him at an angle with its kind of with its tail up in the air. And you'll need to hold them there for a little bit. Cute, and you're all finished. So you've got Mama Bird. Mother's Day eggs tomorrow. <laughs> and then the little bird that sits on the handle. Now, if you wanted to make this arrangement out of commercial flowers, uh, if you wanted to go to Trader Joe's or Vaughn's or any place that you would, you would buy flowers, um, you could use in the center uh, pussy willows for the, to replace the salvia flowers. Uh, you could use miniature gladiolus to get that spiky look, this spiky look right here. Um, you could use forsythia. Um, and then for the pensamen, um, you could use bells of Ireland or you could use delphinium. Um, you could use snapdragons or you could use stock, would, would work well. It's a, again, a, a spiral shaped flower. Uh, for the yellow lupin blossoms, um, a little sprig of lilac, uh, hypericum berries, uh, and then for the balia, the desert marigold, uh, miniature carnations would work out beautifully. Now you might have some mimulus. I didn't use the mimulus. This is um, diplicus. It is a monkey flower. And this, if you have any holes, go back and just kind of 
plug this in. It has probably some spent flowers toward the bottom. Take those off. And Linda, you're giving advice about using commercially grown ones because at some times of year, your cutting garden at home might not be doing what you want it to do to support your right. flower arranging hobby. We've, and we've got a lot of different flowers in here. Um, and I think probably most people wouldn't have all the varieties in their yard or have access to them. So they, they could redo this arrangement using commercial flowers. You see how the mimulus adds just a, another touch of color, a little bit of mm -hmm. orangey. It's beautiful. It's very beautiful. Yeah. So now you have an arrangement for mom or for yourself or for anybody who's a mother in your family. Um, I would encourage you to come out to the garden. It's absolutely beautiful this time of year. Uh, as the heat rises, the flowers will start to wilt and, and die off. But right now, the, the matillahas, the big patches of desert marigold, uh, phalia, and great big patches of penstemon are gorgeous. And the woolly blue curls are prettier this year than I've ever seen them. So um, there's lots you can do. You should come and visit, take a nice walk. Definitely. And we have a question about if we can purchase these, if these plants are available in the Grow Native Nursery. Many, many of them are available in the Grow Native Nursery. Um, this year, we're, our nursery is all online and you can check the inventory through our, our website, calbg.org, and there's the online store. And so you can see if any of them are available um, and that's where you can grow your own. And the florist supplies, we typically purchase at Floral Supply Syndicate on Arrow Route in Upland. And the public can go in there and make purchases. That's where we bought the baskets and the liners, um, the tape, and I think Kristen, everything else, right? Yep, pretty much everything. The decorative items, um, the foam, everything from Floral Supply Syndicate this time. And if you're more comfortable going to Hobby Lobby or Michael's, you'll find a lot of the materials there also. Yeah. And, and Linda, the matilla that hasn't bloomed yet, will it bloom later on in the basket? It should. The, the, uh, you got you know, you need to add water every day to this. And if you're um, going to place it on wood or on your dining room table or on a side table, you've got to use a saucer because the, the basket is going to be damp on the bottom and it will ruin your wood. So no matter what kind of an arrangement you're doing, if it's a centerpiece in a basket or in a vase, I always encourage a ceramic plate underneath or a saucer of some kind to protect your furniture. And even if it's a ceramic, it needs to be one of those that's coated so it doesn't kind of soak through, yeah. The, and the, the Matilaha, I, my guess is that the, um, the, the buds that are of a certain size will probably go ahead and, um, and finish maturing and open. The tiny little ones probably won't, um, yeah. but you should get some, some longevity um, out, of, out of it. Yeah, the, the buds that are, that are bigger. And then we, I also see a question, the, was there a thin wire in addition to your thicker wire? That was a gift from Kristen. <laughs> You've got a thin wire as a gift. Yeah, the thin wire came with the birds. And so I thought just in case, I'll give them to you all. <laughs> so you have the thin wire as well. Our gift to you, a thin wire. <laughs> it's as good as it gets. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Linda. That was wonderful. Um, and as you all are kind of continuing and finishing up your final touches and tweaks, um, we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about more about these plants themselves. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get this going. The, the other thing, I'm going to go ahead and put in a plug for this wonderful book. Can you see? No, you can't see. I'll, I'll do this later. But we have a wonderful book that will help you make your own uh, native cuttings garden. 
that's called California in a Vase, and it is um, for sale very inexpensively at uh, the Poppy Shop, which is by the, right by the entrance to the garden. All right, so, oops. All right, so this was our arrangement that we made today. And you can see all of the various plants that we that we used that we kind of touched on already. But I'm going to go ahead and Lucinda, can you tell us a little bit more about woolly blue curls? Woolly blue curls is one of the most amazing plants um, that are in the native flora of California. Um, the it, it is amazingly drought tolerant. We do normally sell it in the nursery, but it sells out quickly, so you might have to look at it. It gets to be about um, maybe three feet high and at least three feet wide. It really does not want any water in the summer. And so my joke is that if you look, if you go out in the middle of the summer and look at it sympathetically, um, it might not respond well. It really likes summer drought. Um, it also really likes to plant itself. And so some of the most amazing plants that we have around our garden are plants that planted themselves. So you have to be a little patient and a little persistent to get a good woolly blue curls going, but it's amply worth it. There is also a hybrid that was made by horticulturists between our native one and one that's native, I think, to Mexico. And that one is actually very, very, very garden adapted. So that one's called Midnight Magic. So watch for that. You can see that that plant on the right there planted itself because it's right there by the by the path. And what I mean by planted itself is just that the seeds dispersed there and when everything was right, the seed the, the seed germinated and the plant came up. Gorgeous plant. Bee pollinated, the bees get kind of drunk on it. All right. And can you tell us a little bit more about California goldenrods or Solidago, the, the plant that was purchased from the flower market. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's interesting that it's in the, that it's in the trade. This is in the sunflower family. I know those little thingies don't really look like sunflowers, but they're in um, the same, the, the same plant family. Um, it is a uh, genus that is super species rich in the eastern U.S. and less species rich here in California, which is kind of the reverse of the of the normal pattern, but it's easy to grow, um, grows really well. It's, it's interesting that it's, that it's in the horticulture trade as a, or in the, in the, uh, in the flower arranging trade, florist trade, um, because it's not as commonly in the, in the nursery trade, but if you can get one, uh, grow it. It's a great plant and it also flowers a little bit, tends to flower a little bit out of season compared to others. Mm -hmm. Wait, we have a question about goldenrod is not good for those of us. So here's the thing, um, and I'm glad that you raised that question because um, the um, goldenrod gets a bad rap because in the East in particular, it flowers at the same time as um, ambrosia, as um, ragweed. Um, and the ragweed does not have very obvious flowers but it puts lots and lots of pollen into the air. And it's that pollen of the ragweed that people are very allergic to. In fact, I'm very allergic to one species of ragweed. Um, and I can tell you more about that if you're interested, but it's not a pretty story. But in any case, the goldenrod happens to flower at the same time, but the goldenrod is pollinated by insects and anything that's pollinated by insects is not going to put a lot of pollen into the air. And because it doesn't put pollen into the air, it actually is not uh, going to be something that you will respond to badly. So I really doubt that you would have a, a bad reaction to, to goldenrod. Um, again, I think it's sort of a spurious correlation. No one really sees the, uh, the ambrosia in flower because the flowers are very not obvious because it's wind pollinated. Instead, you see the golden, beautiful flowers of the goldenrod at exactly the same time and you think that's what it is. Great, and so Linda, we have some pictures here of goldenrod in use in various ways. Is there anything else you wanted to add about uses for goldenrod in arrangements? 
Um, we have it planted in the in the natives garden up here, but we have it in a contained bed because it spreads by, I guess, underground stolons, Lucinda. I'm not sure what the right term is, but yeah. it can take over. So you want to keep it in a bed that where you can keep control of it. But yeah. it's a, a good cut flower. It lasts a long time, and yeah, I like it. It's a pretty flower. Yeah, that especially the one on the right. Um, it adds verticality to the arrangement in a very nice way. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I have a, there's a question if we could show the final arrangement we made today again, and I will after this a little bit. So I'll show, we'll be able to see that again. Um, but here we are, just another picture of goldenrod a little closer up, growing here at the garden. And what about white sage? So white sage is, um, is a, a wonderful, wonderful plant um, that's native right around us here in uh, in Southern California in Claremont. It's also a plant that's of tremendous um, cultural importance to the indigenous people of our area, used as a as a, a smudge um, uh, source. And um, but it's great, absolutely great in your garden. It requires no uh, water whatsoever once it's established beautiful white foliage that's very, very fragrant. The flowering stalks can get very, very, very long. They can get like six feet long. And so you're gonna to want to have a bit of a plan for controlling those, which can very readily involve clipping them and putting them into your arrangements. Even just a, the simplest of arrangement, Linda will kill me for saying this probably, but of just the, the white sage flowers um, would be really uh, terrific with some white sage um, leaves would be just absolutely terrific. The flowers, if you they're small, but if you take a very close look at them, you can see that there's all kinds of complicated things going on in there with regard to the sex parts and the bees that pollinate them have to interact with those sex parts. It's a really great, really great plant. Yeah, strongly recommended. And so, Linda, I know that we've used the rosettes before. Um, so that it's pretty versatile, it seems, in arrangements. Is that true? Yeah, the, the rosettes are uh, good almost all year round, but in early spring like this, they're a little bit too soft. So once they've started to flower, it's not appropriate to cut the rosettes. We can use the flower of it now, uh, and then in a few weeks when it hardens off, we'll go back to cutting the rosettes. Gotcha. And by rosettes, you mean just the 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 chunks of leaves like there on the left right on the left and so lucinda is white sage endangered in california do you know one of the issues with white sage is because of the great popularity of um of sort of uh honoring mimicking indigenous customs it is um being harvested from wildlands and in, in a not very sustainable way and so if you do buy saging products that are made with white sage, it's really, really important to make sure that they are, have been ethically harvested and not from public lands. If you, there are places that you can go on public land in Southern California where you can see that the white sage has been harvested in, in a way that just basically cuts it back to the ground. And that's really, um, really not good. So plant your own white sage so that you have your own source to make smudge sticks and you have your own source for um, arrangements. They're, it's very easy to grow. There's really no excuse for, um, for uh, trying to collect it in the wild. Right. And then so here we have our, our yellow lupin. And yellow lupin is a spectacular thing. It's, um, it's of a species that actually has a bluish, normal sort of bluish morph, as well as this spectacular yellow morph. Um, and we grow the yellow morph at the garden um, very, very routinely. I, uh, my husband and I bought a couple of uh, small pots of these, um, the yellow lupin last year at Grow Native Nursery. And we're very, very happy to have it come up again in our garden this year. So I advise you to get some and then be sure to let it go to, um, to seed, which means you keep it going uh, after it stops looking beautiful and, um, and let the fruits then develop and then let it uh, spread seeds around. But these pagoda-like inflorescences, flowering stalks that it has are just terrific. 
And if you look closely at your yellow lupin that you have, you can see that the older flowers are near the base of the flowering stalk. And then if you go toward the tip of it, you will often find uh, buds there. And so what that means is that that flowering stalk that you've put into your arrangement is going to last a long time as those flowers kind of age and, and open. They might stop opening before they get to the very tip um, because it was uh, hoping to be still connected to the plant that grew it. But um, yeah, it adds beautiful color and beautiful verticality again, I think, to the, to the arrangement. Is that right, Linda? Is that how you describe it? That's how I would describe it. It also, when you put it in a vase like the one that's pictured here, it will actually elongate when it's in the water. Right. Uh, like like tulips do. They kind of put on a couple of inches. And uh, so that's fun. You might have to trim it down a little bit and put it back into your arrangement. But it's a, it's a spectacular flower. As long as you keep it watered, remember to keep the... Um, Keep the keep the water up in your in, in this case you're going to have to keep watering the the insert there keep watering the oasis to keep it moist all of these things about the arrangement developing and the plants continuing to mature and elongate uh, really depends on water access to water if it dries out all bets are off right all right one last photo of our lupin and then our our showy spin uh, pin stem in. So penstemon means five stamens, um, which is kind of funny because it only has four. Stamens are the, the part of the flower that produce the pollen. Um, and in the case of penstemons, the fifth stamen is this fuzzy thing that's in there. So uh, pry into your flower just a little bit and have a look at, the, um, at it. And I think you'll see the fuzzy brush-like thing that is in the top of the, um, of, of, the, of the flower. These things are marvelous, as Linda said, back in the habitat section of our garden. In fact, if you, you don't even have to visit the garden, just walk past the northwest corner of the garden on Indian Hill, and you'll see Penstemon spectabilis completely um, uh, in full flower there. It's absolutely gorgeous. Indian Hill and the northwest part of our garden, just south of uh, Radcliffe in Claremont. I love the one on the left because you can see the way that Linda has used the penstemon spectabilis to add width, and but but while keeping the arrangement low, remember the adage that if you're making a centerpiece for a table, you want the people to be able to see each other across the the uh, the arrangement, or else it's kind of um, not good. And so she's used the penstemon in a beautiful way to add width and keep it um, kind of kind of narrow there in the middle of the table. It's a terrific plant. Lots of species of penstemon that you can play with. Essentially all of them are gorgeous in arrangements. So when you're making your list of plants to plant in your own uh, cuttings garden, by all means um, include some penstemons, experiment, find the ones that grow best in your garden, and then you know learn to use those, be adaptive in terms of what, what grows best in, in your garden. And I think we've got pictures of a couple of different species as well. Well, just the pink one, yeah, and then the and then the the standard purple one. You know, the where the colors of roses came from basically is that variation in nature is normal. Lots and lots of plants uh, produce uh, occasional different colors of flowers, and humans have selected those in the case of roses or azaleas or whatever that have been in cultivation for a long time, and then bred those so that they breed true. But you see the same thing in native plants in California, and people have selected the pink one, um, which now breeds true as well. And so, Linda, you use it for height and also for, for width, as we were seeing in that last it's a, a very versatile flower because uh, you can cut it down and put it into a low center piece. But also if you leave the stems about two feet, you can put it in a deep vase and a vase of only penstemon, a little bit of greenery, very, very striking, just dramatic and beautiful. Definitely. And so but before we move on, just to touch on our arrangement we made today, um, how long would you say this would last, Linda, um, if, we're, if they're watering it well, and how often should they water it? 
it'll last about five to six days and you need to check the water every single day and, and top it off. Um, and that's one of the things about Oasis, it must be kept moist because once it dries out, it cannot be re-wet. Right. So you wanna pour water in so it's going over the top of the block of Oasis um, and penetrating clear down to the bottom. So that's another reason to use a saucer. Right. And Linda made a, a sample last, I think, Thursday or Friday, and I was lucky enough to be able to take it home. And it still looks beautiful today. I, I think maybe the Matilaha I had to pull, pull out, but everything else is, is looking great. So it lasts a good while. Yeah, and don't hesitate at all to pull out something that's not looking good and looks like it's done. Just pull it out and then save the rest of it. The rest of it may stay going for a, a, quite a long time. Um, I'm actually very tolerant of native plant arrangements that are a little bit past their prime. To me, they're still wonderful. They still smell great. They still look very, very good. So desert marigold is a plant that can function as an, as an annual, but it also will uh, basically flower all summer long as it does in Fay's Meadow here. Um, it's really a, a totally great plant. Um, once it gets going in your garden, it will keep going. I would say by probably buy seeds and sow the seeds in an area where you're very happy if it comes back year after year after year. The older plants will keep flowering all summer long and then they will make seeds and you'll, it'll, it will spread. It doesn't have to spread, you can pull them up, but um, they're great. The other thing I would say is that, um, is that goldfinches love the, the balia, love the, the, basically once the, um, this, what, 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 we call a flower is actually a, um, a, a very condensed flowering stem and it actually has hundreds of flowers. You can sort of get the idea by the individual sort of nibbins in the, um, in the, in the cup of the, um, of the petals there. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, and then each of those will make a seed that is like a small version of a sunflower seed and the goldfinches just love it. And every now and then you look out in your garden and you might see that the stems look like they're alive. And that's because the goldfinches are in there pulling them apart to eat the stems. But goldfinches are good. Um, Bailey is good. It's all, it's all, wow, that's gorgeous. Linda, both of those are gorgeous. Could you make me those tomorrow, please? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Talk about your use of Bailey in those. Uh, the balia there is, is really the focal point. Um, and the arrangement on the left looks like it has a succulent at the bottom, doesn't it? It does, yeah. But it's also got a white sage and, and developing berries of toyon, which is another yeah. great thing to grow. Yeah, and then the one on the right, what's that tall skinny greenery called? I can't, I'm not, I can't tell. I'm, oh, I know, it's, um, it's adenostoma. It's... Adenostoma. Um, yeah, it's that, it's very striking, isn't it? That, because that is truly a vertical statement right there. Right, exactly. Yeah, and it's yeah that in that arrangement, it's perfectly balanced with the size of the vase. Mm -hmm. Pretty beautiful. Yeah. yeah, really beautiful. Simple, quite simple. Yeah, and there you can see Kristen. Kristen, show everybody the the individual. Those are all individual flowers. Each of those is a separate flower. In is fact, the com couple of big patches out in the habitat, out in the communities that are the prettiest I've ever seen it. I mean, great big patches of balia. Wow. That out close to the big bujum tree. It's just, they're fabulous. It's funny that as little rain as we've had, some things have thought that that was just fine and they're doing yeah. fine. Yeah. I love balia. It's kind of the cutest and happiest flower, I think. You just... It just has so much character <laughs> and, and through its whole lifespan too, as the petals like full, flap over, it's just, it's so fun. Yeah, in fact, in the image on the right and toward the back, right in the middle, you can see a, an old flower that is going into fruit and soon there will be goldfinches sitting on that, ripping the seeds out and being very, very happy about it. And for every other seed that they rip out to eat, they drop one to the ground and that's your balia for next year. Right. Oops. There you go. 
And here's the gorgeous Catalina um, current, the Ribes viburnifolium. And for those of you who have spent time in the eastern part of the US, you might know the genus viburnum. And so what this means is that it, it's the Ribes that has leaves like a viburnum. And it really sort of does. Um, it's a low growing thing, kind of knee high, does absolutely terrific under oaks or under any sort of evergreen plant. The one on the left is a picture of it right in our garden, right along the um, East Mesa Trail, not far from the um, southeast corner of the cultivar garden and the, um, where the great wonderful uh, redwoods are. And the funny thing is that um, I've been told that it doesn't flower very often. And recently, just as I was about to say to somebody I was giving a tour to, you know, we grow this mainly for its foliage because it doesn't flower very often. I noticed that the thing was in absolutely full flower with those beautiful little uh, red flowers. So, but it's really the fragrance of this plant that is, um, it's noted for, the leaves are very fragrant and it's just a beautiful kind of understory and, and obviously, as, um, as Linda used it in this arrangement, just a beautiful source of lovely dark green um, foliage for your arrangements. Definitely. And Linda, I think that we've used, um, used this in all three arranged wild classes. Is, do you think right. That, and yeah. it's used in all of the bud vases that we did for Mother's Day, too. It's a, it's a graceful, arching, um, very easy to use cut greenery. It's beautiful. It really is, yeah. So sticky monkey flower. Um, the foliage on this thing is really quite sticky, as you can see if you uh, if you if you touch when you touch the leaves. Um, it's a this is a very interesting group of plants. It's a relatively small plant family, that and almost all of them have flowers that are quite spectacular. Uh, these are quite large. There's some that are annual plants that have just little teeny uh, beansy flowers, but that have all the same gorgeous sort of uh, floral morphology going on in there. Here's some varieties. This is one that has been selected uh, wildly by humans uh, for the different colors. Um, the one on the lower left is pretty spectacular. Huh? There's one that's called Tabasco for the color of the, of the flowers. And these are just naturally occurring, just, to, just like the genetic variation that's between all of us in terms of hair color and eye color and the like. This is genetic variation in plants between the, um, the different colors of the, of the flowers. And then people take note of that and plant them um, and, and you know, breed them so that they breed true. Great plant to have. One of the things that people do is they plant this plant, they plant a Diplocus longiflorus or another uh, one of our uh, monkey flowers that are native to our area. And it, it goes great gangbusters for a couple years, three years, and then it dies and they feel like they've failed. It's not a very long live plant. And so you simply have to get another plant and um, you know get it going again. It's, its life cycle is such that it just, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's a perennial, it lasts more than one year, but it doesn't last forever. And so you just have to replace it. And that's just how it goes. You're not a failure as a gardener if that happens to you. That's good. <laughs> we use the monkey flower typically as a filler. Uh, you would use the monkey flower the same way you would baby's breath if you were doing a commercial arrangement. And it's just a nice, brilliant spot of color. There's a real light yellow, kind of a buttery yellow out in the communities that such a pretty color. And then this orange is a, is a good contrast in any arrangement. Wonderful. And then the, our chaparral mallow, that beautiful lavender mallow. Yeah, it's a gorgeous thing. I should say that uh, we have a specialist on monkey flowers here at the garden. Naomi Fraga, the director of conservation programs, studies that group and is one of the world's experts on it. She's described a number of uh, brand new species to science not known before her work on it. So the next time you see Naomi, ask her um, about that. Likewise, uh, one of our graduate students, Keir Morse, is a specialist on malacothamnus and he's doing a very detailed study for his dissertation to sort out all, all the different species. It's a confusing group. Um, the, the structure of everything is sort of similar and some people have treated it as one variable complex and other people have separated everything out. 
And so Kira is working very hard um, to come to terms with that. These things are related to hibiscus. Those of you who know hibiscus may um, may sort of be able to picture that it's that the flower is similar. It's got that bunch, that sort of ball of stamens with the pollen right in the middle of the of the flower, just like a hibiscus. Hibiscus are larger flowers, but um, this is uh, the same I basic idea for a um, for a floral plan. And I think the one on the right there is um, apricot mallow, which is actually a different genus for Alcia, um, but very similar sort of in the in the way that the flowers grow. And I think Linda would say, and we'll let her say, that you would use the flowering stems in the same, more or less the same way in an arrangement. Uh, yes, it's the same vertical um, or spray type uh, effect from the flowers. This is these are starting to go out of bloom now. I, I wish we could have had them for the arrangements, but the bunnies love them. Uh, we keep ours fenced and right up against the, the fence on the bottom of the plant, the bunnies have pruned it right up to the wire, uh, but they can't get up high to get the, some of the flowers above. But um, this is one of the most spectacular of the cut flowers that we use here at the garden. The, um, and by the way, the natural source of marshmallows is the mallow plant, this the members of this same family. They have a very gummy sort of sap. Now marshmallows aren't made of that now, they're made of some kind of, you know, just basically sugar and I don't know what all else. Um, but the original source of, um, of marshmallow is, is basically the mallow plant. And again, cotton is in this same family. And if you ever see a cotton plant flowering, the flowers look very much the same. Interesting. Who knew, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we want to really, one of the things we really want to recommend and insist upon is that if you are um, wanting to make arrangements with native plants, that you source them responsibly, that you source them from your own garden or from a friend's garden or from some place, obviously, that's given you permission to, um, to harvest. Um, and the cuttings garden that the native designs uh, people have established here at the garden, which is just sort of at the northeast end of the um, of the Mesa of Indian Hill Mesa, if you are not familiar where that is, any any garden staff member can show you on the on the map. But they have set up a glorious cuttings garden, and it's not a huge area. If you don't have a large yard, you can still uh, make a very nice cuttings garden. You could even make a cuttings garden and a few large pots, as long as you choose your, um, your species uh, carefully. And this lovely book that um, Kristen is showing you and that I have a copy of on my, on my desk, um, it was very recently published, California in a Vase. And this is a collaboration with the wonderful Susan Gottlieb uh, who lives over in Beverly Hills and who is a major fan of native plants. And as soon as she saw the uh, designs from native from our native designs group, she just fell head over heels with the with the idea of designing with native plants and became absolutely committed to doing this gorgeous coffee table book. Um, the We have it for sale in the poppy shop. It's extremely um, affordable. And in fact, I think a little a little glimmer of a secret is that Kristen will send you a follow up email um, that will have um, a coupon that you can use to get even more of a discount than it's already available for. So I strongly recommend that you get it, read up on it, look at the lists of plants and think about the things that you would most enjoy growing in your own garden, even in, as I said, in large pots or planters. And soon you'll be uh, working with your own homegrown materials. Right, it's a great source of inspiration for your, your floral arranging all throughout the year of every season. But it's, it's a right. beautiful. Kristen makes a very good point, which is that it's arranged by season. And so uh, it will help you to know what on earth to do come September, October, when nothing is in flower, there are still things that you can do. In some cases, very, very simple. Um, you know, not really gaudy, not lots of flowers, but very simple and very beautiful designs that still involve native plants, which is terrific. And thanks to Linda Prendergast, who was the um, 
really the inspiration of the whole book and who uh, contributed mightily to it. Thank you. Yeah. And so that pretty much concludes our, our range wild, but I thought I'd open it up. If you had any lingering questions that you would like answered, you can put them into the chat or into the Q&A and we can address some of those. Um, there was a question about if we added anything to the water uh, for the flowers and we did add a floral preservative in those buckets of water so that we did use that. But if you have any other questions for Linda or for Lucinda about the plants themselves, we're happy to address those now. Kristen, do we want to, um, we, the one thing that we would like to ask you, um, all of you participants, and Kristen, I think is gonna do this in the email so that we have a record of your responses, is um, whether you would like to have this continue to happen virtually like this, or whether you would like to come in and have an in-person sort of class, in-person instruction, once everybody is vaccinated and we're all feeling safe about being together again. So think about that and we would love to have your feedback on that. Yeah, definitely. And so I will be sending a follow-up email that will have the, the coupon that Lucinda mentioned for the Native Designs uh, California in a Vase book, but then also the links to the YouTube. If you, I know that one person, their computer shut down for a moment during the presentation. So you'll be able to find the recording on YouTube and on the digital content page of the CalBG website. Um, so you'll have that there and I'll send that out pretty much immediately after the class. The, the recording takes a little bit to process but I should have it up by the end of the day. That's an interesting point somebody makes is that their arrangement would feel very precarious to take it home. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can tell you, uh, I, I, um, I'll, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I have driven um, native designs arrangements all over the state of California from at least, um, ooh, where am I, like Paso Robles and, and then Palm Springs, east of Palm Springs, to important people. And the trick is that you get <laughs> a, a, a case wine box that's been cut off and that has retained the bottle holder thingy, you know, the divider thing inside. And then you put your arrangement down in there and the, the bottle holder sort of keeps it stable. Linda brings them to me like that. And um, I've driven them all over California without any, um, any problem whatsoever. Sometimes a little tiny bit of slosh in the car. And then you also tell the person you're giving it to water it, be sure to water it. And, um, and, then, um, and then it's great and they love it and it's all wonderful. Everybody feels very special when they get a native designs arrangement. Definitely. Well, I think we've answered everyone's questions, you know, and thank you for your comments about whether we should continue virtual or in person and, and for just joining us today. It's been a wonderful class and we're glad that we could do this for, with you all. And, you know, special thanks to Linda and Lucinda for being here today and guiding us through the process of making these arrangements and kind of giving us a little bit more info about the plants that we're using and how we can grow them at home. So I hope that you all enjoyed it and we hope to see you all in the garden very soon. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Lucinda. Thank you everybody. Wonderful to be with you all. Thank Enjoy you. your arrangements. Take care.